And we are back, baby. Continuing to make our way through Berserk. But before we get into it, if you haven't already seen it, the poll to figure out which manga series is going to get the Berserk treatment next here on the channel is live. So if you'd like to vote between any of the 20 or so options that currently are being voted on, I encourage you to check out the link in the description down below and you can help me choose which manga I will hopefully be falling in love with just as much as Berserk. Or it'll be a bit more of a negative read-through experience. I don't know. I actually think that would be interesting though, to go through a manga that I feel like a lot more conflicted on. That way I have a lot more to like critically say as I go through it, because the one thing I've been lacking in this berserk read through in my opinion is things to really dive deep into in terms of heavily criticizing. I will say the two series currently in the lead are Vinland Saga and Chainsaw Man. Which one's first and second? I'll never say until actually I do say next week when the poll closes and I will be releasing a winner video. I also want to quickly say there's not going to be an uncensored version of this episode posted to Patreon because there's not really much I need to censor here. It's like four or five panels and I feel like I'd be devaluing the uncensored versions by putting this with them. So I hope you understand I'm trying to just not artificially inflate the value of my patron and the people who support me there. I love you. I appreciate it so much. And yeah, the uncensored ones are usually great and a lot of fun, but it's not that much different in this case. So I'm just going to let it be so you don't end up clicking on that one, expecting a big difference and not getting it. But without any further ado, let's go ahead and get into Berserk, Conviction Arc, Birth Ceremony, Chapter Revelations, Part 1. So where we left off, Guts just got done dealing with the Holy Iron Chain Knights, who I'm anticipating getting more heavily involved with the demonic side of things and suffering very heavy casualties. That's my big prediction. To serve as like a twisted band of the hawk that Guts becomes opposed to, but sharing many similarities to what the band used to have for him. I don't know, that's just my shot in the dark, maybe, but we're actually not picking up with Guts right away. And instead we get more of like an update check-in on the world for a while, and I'm not going to go too specific here because I want to go ahead and get to the gut stuff. But what we largely see is this world has been shifting more and more into darkness. There are plagues and natural disasters that are just ruining life for your everyday person, as well as more and more stories and myths of unbelievable horrors moving in the night. And that's actually a specific choice I'm liking more and more the further we get from the eclipse, because the cheaper version of what the eclipse did to this world is just having like a flip switch and everything is a hellscape and there's just demons everywhere and blah, 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 blah. But instead what we're seeing is what feels like a much more sinister, slow churn into darkness that's working with the worst of humanity and exploiting it to put the worst in power and to allow the real darkness and evils of the world to become an institution rather than just a big blanket fire. And at least to me as a reader, that's far more terrifying and fits with the type of evil we have seen within Berserk that is largely rooted into the evils we as people can commit ourselves. I mean, again and again, this series is showing us that humans can do just as f***ed up stuff as the worst of the demons, and in fact, they can like earn a place among them. But we see another what seems to be a religious figure high up within, I think, the same Holy Iron Chain Knights group. No, he's not. He's just a lord of Western Midland, which was my mistake. There was just something religious said during this scene, and so I assumed he was. But then I recognized him, and I think we've seen this character before, but I'm terrified to check the wiki because spoilers, so I don't know. Trying to help people who have been caught up in the natural disaster, coming across a city that is essentially completely empty aside from dead bodies from plague and rats feeding on them. And there's this continual imagery of a white hawk battling against what honestly just looks like a depiction of death. And just cementing home how all of this is really connected to Eclipse, we even see the face of one of the demons or angels. I say with the biggest f***ing quotation marks ever, have its face immersed from a pile of rats that are feeding on a body to release a bunch of haunting looking spirits. Man, Berserk is just so good at just riding the vibe it's built. I don't know if that makes complete sense, but like so many series struggle to be like, this is our tone, and then to like try and consistently maintain it without becoming parody of itself. Berserk is so over the top bleak that what feels like it could be parody in lesser material just absolutely fits into what's established. We also once again see the image of the behelet hanging from a crucifix that has the white hawk crucified on it. 
symbolism. But cutting back to Windham Castle where Princess Charlotte are and the king, we do see the king is dying dead and has descended into just complete madness. His religious right hand seems to be also just completely a shadow of what he was and Princess Charlotte has completely secluded herself and while she hasn't left the palace in two years, now she hasn't even left her room in five days. And from the torment we know her father has been putting her through, her not exactly going to him in his final hours, very understandable. And a decision I entirely support, Charlotte. Abusers in your life do not deserve even the slightest inch from you in times even like this. If there is someone who has done the level of things that King has done, you do not owe them anything ever. But in the King's final feverish dying minutes, he seems to see a vision of Charlotte being enveloped by the White Hawk imagery we've seen before that turns into Griffith. So we know uh, this is not a, a, symbol, a beacon of good, no, I'm not trusting that, no, if this is anything more than the king's mad vision. I'm not entirely sure how much is prophecy and deep layered meaning and how much is just the madman seeing things, but what we see later makes me think this is more actually like a literal vision we're supposed to be uh, taking as some form of actual resonance to what's going on in the world. In his actual final moments, right before we see the announcement of his death bring relief to Charlotte and his actual soldiers that are keeping him from his daughter, he even expresses a wanting to abandon the throne. The weight of it on his shoulders seems to be too much and he considers it a prison, which really adds to the mystery for me of what exactly this vision of the White Hawk we're seeing again and again appear to people is. Is it actually some form of Griffith's presence? Is it a metaphor? Is it something beyond that? I have absolutely no idea. It's just as imagery is so holy, well, the actual visualization of it for us, the reader, is so twisted and dark. But in the final frames with Charlotte essentially asking Griffith to save her from her father right after he dies, we also see a massive army is about to descend on the city. So the nations of man are certainly not demobilized by the awful things going on and political infighting is still going to be resulting in massive war because the army we see has elephants, some what seems not to be of this culture armor, and war war is going to always be a part of humanity. No matter how bad things get, actually, I would say the worse things get a more uh, prominent part of humanity. We're just great. God, and I love that about Berserk, though, because it's the absolute incredible balance of the beauty of humanity and the worst of it, because we do see, yes, on these larger scales, we see awful things being done and, you know, people who are in the worst situations possible, but when we pull away and have some distance from those situations, Berserk does not back away though from also showing the beauty and love within humanity and I think that's what makes it so readable. If it lost that, it would just be a miserable slog and I wouldn't be able to continue on with the series. But there are those really beautiful light beacons of just gorgeous moments that shine all the brighter because of how dark the story and world is. But I get so hype because from here we cut to the best character in Berserk Nosferatu Zah! I love me some Zadi. I, he's Z he's Zaddy Zadi. I don't know how else to put it. He's had so little page time where we actually like are learning what he is, but he's made such an impact. The beast, the behemoth, the destroyer of anything he views as less than him, which in my opinion is everything. Mother fucking Zod. is having a contemplative quiet moment on top of 300 bodies he's massacred. Uh, it seems to celebrate the fact that he's been doing it for over 300 years. Good on you, queen. What a great way to celebrate. But he is talking about how he's just like moved beyond getting satisfaction in this. There's only one person, obviously that writer who he's had a bit of a rivalry with, who gives him any form of thrill to go against to fight. And then he also thinks of Guts and is like, oh yeah, because we have learned it's been a full two years since the events of Eclipse. But in a vision, in an exact same depiction as the Mad King saw, we see Nosferatu Zod see a giant uh, hawk of light and whiteness land before him. And he transforms trying to challenge it and the hawk just slices off his horn. And we see he kind of starts and is like, that was a 
fucking weird dream, but he looks down and his horn actually has been cut off. And I think that's a really interesting way to not undercut Zod's power, yet establish that there is other powers at play from the evil side of things that are, yes, emphasizing the derision that has been already stated to be there, but build right away that Zod does not necessarily have those, and that means this other threat is going to be a threat in a new way. If this was handled worse, it would make Zod feel like less, but Zod feels like just as big a physical threat because this was an attack, what seems like in another plane, another way that Zod just happens to not have been prepared in, and so of course, Guts won't be either. But we catch back up with Guts and Puck, and they're kind of talking about how the world has gone to shit. Everyone is just either suffering from plague, the loss of food, they're just watched from windows by specters who don't give them places to rest like they used to. And Puck essentially tells Guts like, let's just go sleep on that hill, cause that's the best we're gonna get. Which just looks exactly like Stonehenge for some reason. Cool. And when Guts does this, he starts having a dream of Casca being burned at the stake. And he awakes from this dream, obviously like, oh, dreams are important in this section of Berserk, it seems. So let's, let's really lean into this. <laughs> but in a shadow under the sunlight, he sees that fetusy thing that's him and Casca's child. And it starts giving him a vision, letting him know that Casca is really in danger. And it seems specifically from religious fanatics due to the language being used, things like, when the sky falls at the holy ground, blind sheep gather and erect a pillar of fire. Hurry, quickly. Which is very reflective of something that Zod said in his section, so it makes me think, oh, this is just some form of trap, something to lure guts in, but we also find out that Casca has gone missing from where she was being held due to a lapse in security, and so I'm thinking it also could be genuine? I don't know. But Guts then decides to head on back to the blacksmith and Rickert and the little girl watching over Casca. And when he arrives, they have like a happy reunion for like two seconds before Guts is like, shut, shut, shut the, shut the f up. Where's Casca? Is she okay? And that's when they're told that they brought Casca out from the cave. And during that time, she escaped. And Guts begins to harshly lecture them for this. Though they do kind of push back on him. or like, you left us here for two years, man. It's been two years. You can't. What? And I'm totally on their side. They were just left for like an indefinite amount of time to watch over this person. Uh, they're kids with an elderly man and the world sucks. I, this isn't gonna be a perfect system. We find out the blacksmith, the old man, is staying in bed, not nearly in the shape he used to be, and him and Guts start having a private conversation that is one of those moments in terms of character observations from Berserk that are quite common, where if the observations weren't so poignant and well-written, it would feel blunt and too exposition-y, too summation-y of what we're already supposed to know, but it's executed well enough and fits within who this character is strongly strongly enough that I just don't mind that, yes, it's a character essentially looking at someone going like, here's where you're wrong, boop. But what we get from the old man is, Blade Nick's blood rust bins shouldn't be this way even after 10 years. This is gonna take more than just a little elbow grease. You really make a blacksmith cry, you know that? I'm guessing you swing and shoot too often to eat or sleep. You can't stay sane forever fighting that way. Huh, <laughs> your face looks even more tense now than it did before. So if you don't hate that much, you wouldn't be able to stand up, huh? Two years ago, when Rickert rolled in here with the two of you, I didn't know what it was that happened to all of you. But afterwards, when that monster came calling, I guess I had some clue what it could have been. So you're waging a war against things like that. I can't even say that in itself is sane. But even if your reason is retaliation, revenge, ain't you just escaping to war, to hatred? Just listen, it's the ramblings of a dying old man. The thing about hatred, it's the place where people who can't look sorrow in the eye without wavering run off to. Vengeance is like soaking a blood-rusted sword in even more blood and sharpening it. You sink the blade called your heart deep into the blood in order to fix the nicks called sorrow. The more you sharpen it, the more it rusts. So you sharpen it again. In the end, all that's left is a pile of rust and scraps. To which Gutch kind of balks at and he's like, look, what do you want me to do? Become a blacksmith or something? And the blacksmith continues, I wouldn't blame you if you wanted to. You've got some huge nicks in your heart. Damn cracks called fear. 
running all through it. And Guts kind of starts actually opening up about his trauma in a way that I haven't seen him do yet. And even Puck hasn't gotten this much from him, but he starts talking about how he just watched everybody die and they just were gone like insects. And it's not just about the fact that they died, it's the fact that what they could have been, the good they could have been in the world was squashed and taken away, which is one of the worst parts. Uh, I know personally from having someone close to you die, you end up inevitably mourning what their future could have been. One of the least spoken about, but hardest parts of the grieving process, at least in my experience. But the old man continues, you abandoned those irreplaceable things. You went alone. On that day two years ago, in your hopeless suffering, you left the last irreplaceable things you had and went away by yourself. And he's talking about Casca, and he continues on to essentially say like, you've gone on this war path, and you say you lost all these special things, but you still had Casca, and you left her here for two years, abandoning her for your own selfish, like, plight to continue this war. Do you have any place criticizing Rickert who stayed here? Do you have any place talking about revenge for your friends when you're the one who went off abandoning that girl here? When push comes to shove, you go and choose to be alone and rely on fighting. You're like a drawn sword on the battlefield, one with countless nicks soaked in blood and rusting, with a lethal crack in it, a sword that's beginning to break. And I love this because there's two ways to read it. And the first is a literal what Guts is going up against and what we know as the reader would come for him if he just stayed here. And in that sense, the old man is wrong. He needed to go away. He needed to go down this path, this journey, for not only the safety of Casca, who would have been you know, constantly having people drawn to him due to the brand and things like that. The two of them together, I believe, would have been too strong of a pull. But there is a threat to the world that Guts needs to go take down to end this age of darkness. Does he necessarily actually go for those reasons though? That's where the old man is absolutely right. While Guts is an incredibly brave fighter, he is an emotional coward. He's emotionally stunted. He can't grieve. I I've seen this before. He is not emotionally mature enough. He has not processed his trauma enough to actually feel the sorrow deep in him. It's why all we get from him in terms of processing is anger and murder and brutality. And the old man is right. He's leaping at the opportunity to take on this quest to continue that path where he just can be this wave of destruction. And the fact that Puck even hasn't gotten fully filled in on what happened shows how little Guts himself has addressed it. And this small bit of opening up to this old man is a massive beat of growth for him that you just hope as a reader is the beginning of a door opening to a wider uh, section of growth for Guts as a character. But with how bleak and brutal this world is, and the clip we just solved knows for Zod, you don't really necessarily believe it's going to go the best way it could. And that's such a great example of how the consistency of tone for Berserk can make you as a reader feel so conflicted over a monologue that otherwise wouldn't necessarily work. And this is going to bring me to probably my biggest criticism of Berserk as a whole, why I don't think it's perfect, and that's that I believe quite a bit of its narrative is told clunkily. It's told extremely emotionally well. There's just a lot of plot beats that occur that just feel like they need to occur in this moment or the narrative leaps to it too quickly, and that can be a problem. But you're so invested. The vision of this world from the creator is so clear that it makes up for that weakness in some substantial ways. But we then get another beat that shows Guts, I think, in a softer light than we've seen him in a long time, where he goes to a graveyard that Rickert has made. Rickert says, it's nowhere near the right number, but I made them as practice. It's not like everybody's underneath here, and maybe I'm just consoling myself, but we did this all the time in the field, didn't we? Yes, this is such a great, like, Guts has done nothing. Rickert's actually healing, and it's showing how him taking these two years to just work on himself, be with good people, be in an environment that allows him to emotionally thrive has made it so he can have these steps forward, these monuments to the loss he felt that isn't just stunting him as an individual. And in the final beat of this that's supposed to give you even more hope as a reader, we see Guts apologize 
for Rickert for earlier when he got mad and it's just, oh, character growth, you feel so good. And when Guts is alone at night within the cave Casca was supposed to be staying in that's trying to keep him safe due to its former elven aura so that he doesn't get attacked in the night, we see Guts is so traumatized by obviously the last two years that he's living, he can't sleep at night. Even if he knows he's not gonna get attacked, he can't sleep, which is so sad. Guts is this uber badass, but he's also one of the most like sympathetic characters I've read this year. You're just constantly for this dude who will like tear the spine out of a demon being like, oh, but we see Guts have a form of his own resolution for what the old man said that I really like, where after seeing some more visions of what was done to Casca in front of him, he says, I didn't run away. I can't run. Not from the last thing seared into my right eye. Which means, I, oh my, I think it's just saying he's never stopped seeing it out of that eye that was blinded, which is... Oof. And we see that demon that's been whispering in his ear even say, The blood must flow, so keep killing. It will still thirst forever, all alone, always. And this is maybe my one criticism of this emotional series of beats for Gus. This intrusion feels a bit too blunt. And I also thought it couldn't happen while he's in the cave, but I guess I'm wrong there. But Guts begins to compare his own abandonment of Casca in this moment from when he left the band of the Hawk. But he also remembers Judo's consoling words to him where he basically said like, this isn't your responsibility anymore. And he remembers when Judo told him to take Casca and go and <laughs> how different things would be now if he'd listened. <laughs> but where it ends, I think, is the most important thing to Guts in the world right now, the most precious memory he has. And he thinks about the time him and Casca actually got to spend together and make love and just be themselves and feel the feelings openly they had for one another. And he starts seeing her in the cave after the eclipse when he learned that she was alive and okay and how, of course, happy that made him feel the relief and the final emotional beat of this which is so beautiful is guts out loud admitting to himself that the only reason he's alive isn't just anger and revenge it's the precious things he still has in his life like Casca, and he berates himself for not seeing it sooner and then he remembers the vision of her in trouble and he stands not yet it's not too late this time i swear i'll never lose her again and that is where we are going to end here. I've made it abundantly clear what I really loved about this section, how it definitely structurally is choppy as hell and is just working as setup, 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 setup. But I don't mind too much because I'm just so steeped in the miasma of this world at this point that seeing all these different political setups, it's trying to fill in the gaps of what's been going on in the background. Well, the time skip is happening. At no point did it kick me out of the story and I just want to keep going, 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 going. I'm going to say Revelations isn't as great as The Best of Berserk, but it had some really outstanding executions of what this two years has provided for Guts as a character in terms of growth. It's made me filled with dread of what will happen in the future to re-traumatize him and send him down the darkest paths because that's berserk and I'm sure it's going to happen. On a written level, I had complaints, but again, the setup for the next piece, absolutely sensational. There's definitely though gonna start being a severe case of diminishing returns if the bigger narrative doesn't really start kicking into gear. I'm a little bit running out of leash for setup for the next big deal, but hey, it really feels like things might be kicking up soon. So this might be a criticism in hindsight that I'm like, no, it was just the right amount of time. I'm not sure. But anyway, like and subscribe if you have not already. Hit the Patreon if you wanna support what I do here. And don't forget to vote in the manga poll down there. That's gonna decide what, do you want Chainsaw Man? Ben Lin Saga? Tokyo Ghoul's also doing really well. Absolutely, the poll could still sway. It's surprisingly close. Have a good one, y'all. Bye. And of course, I'd like to record a special shout out to my latest high tier Patreons, Leander Taker, Johnny B, and Jonathan Jacobs. Thank you so much.